fellow Canadian. I was born and raised in Calgary, Tech Central. <laughs> I actually, I spent about 18 years as an entrepreneur um, in Calgary. I, I was in technology companies my entire career. And that was hard, man. Really, really hard. Because Calgary is not, you know, the place where you go to find technology I mean, at that time. And nowadays, things have changed. Nowadays, startup ecosystems are appearing all over the place. And I just want to talk to you a little bit about my journey as an entrepreneur and uh, how I ended up at, at Microsoft and, and what it's like being an entrepreneur inside a big company. I can tell you it hasn't been easy, um, but it's, uh, it's, it's, been a, it's been quite an interesting time. So I'll tell you a little bit about that and, um, and then what we're doing now. I didn't name the talk Super Size Me. I really don't know where that came from. So um, this is, this is kind of what the story is about. So let me first start with Voodoo. Uh, this is a company that I, I'm probably most known for, it's, uh, and, and many of you probably don't know what it is, but Voodoo is a, um, a high-end personal computer company. We were building desktop Ferraris, essentially. We were building notebooks and desktops that were absolutely beautiful. Back when PCs were being heavily commoditized and there was no real uh, soul behind personal computing or behind the hardware. We were basically taking a luxury or a commodity and turning it into a luxury. I started this company when I was in high school, many years ago. And, um, and you know, I, I, was, I was listening to Jeff Hoffman and I gotta tell you, he, he just blew my mind. I mean, I really, I think he was amazing. I wanna just give him a quick applause because um, when I started Voodoo, I was, I was you know, 17 years old. I started off as a sole proprietor building these computer systems in, in, in my dad's carpet store. It was, it was unbelievable. Um, you know, and, and basically I was just into building these things because I loved computers. I loved to hack. I loved to play with the hardware. I've been playing with hardware since, you know, I can, I can remember. I mean, I had every single game console you can imagine. I had every single computer systems. You know, my first Apple was an Apple IIc. Um, and, I, and I sort of graduated from there and I started building these computers at home. And when I first started, my motivations were not the right motivations. They were not to change the world. They were not to make a big impact. In reality, they were just, they were very selfish. And when I was 19 years old, I had made my first million dollars. I was driving a you know, very expensive car. And, uh, and I, was, I was quite well to do. And I, I lost it all within, within two years. I lost it all and then some being stupid, because I wasn't focusing on the right things. I wasn't focused on my business, I wasn't focused on just what I want to do to make a difference in this world, and I was driven by money. And it's a fact, if you are driven by money, if all you're worried about is raising money, if you're worried about getting an income, you should not be an entrepreneur, you should not be in this room, it's, it is hard. It is hard to be an entrepreneur. So. It took me some time to figure that out. And you know, just to kind of give you an idea, Voodoo, we used to build some unbelievable systems. We built the, uh, carbon fiber systems, like fully carbon fiber. They were unibody carbon fiber inside and out. This was one of our carbon fiber notebooks that we built. These were all done from Calgary. This was a, a high-end liquid-cooled machine. We invented liquid cooling in mass. So basically what we did, I was an automotive enthusiast, and I was really into, you know, Porsche, for example, how they took the 911 from air-cooled and they turned it into, or f they went from air-cooling to water-cooling, and this was when they had a, um, a specific model of car. And basically, the idea of taking liquid and turning it into a, um, a, 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 a mass manufacturer so you can create quiet PCs and high-performance PCs was really interesting to me. There was a lot of people sort of doing it in their backyards, but to be able to do this in mass was, was, a, was, a, was a feat. And to create like fanless PCs, PCs that were super quiet, was really something that I was totally into. So I was self-taught. I was a thermal engineer and a designer because I would hack this stuff out in my basement and I started to assemble a really great team of people that came along and, and, and helped and, and uh, came along for the ride. We created this, this unbelievable mass market uh, liquid cooling system that we knew one day, someone is going to come by us. We started with a strategy that was, let's turn this commodity into a luxury. Let's look at these companies that are going downhill, down a, down a, a losing path of 
increased uh, competition, their, their average selling prices are going down, their margins are coming down, and they have no soul. They're building gray, boring boxes, and we want to create something that they absolutely want. We want to build the Lamborghini and help them create the Audi. We want to build the Ferrari and help bring their brand up. And we thought that this was a good strategy. And it actually was. It was, it was actually a, a, a great strategy, and we built this brand, we built this soul of a, of, of a company. We built this soul for the company. And I want to start by, ta by telling you what that means. A brand is more than just a logo. Uh, in, in, in 2005, when, when we were um, first approached by, by Dell, Michael Dell actually contacted me at home. And, uh, and I didn't believe it was him, first of all. He called me on Remembrance Day, um, November 11th. I remember this explicitly. He called at home and said, hi, this is Michael Dell. And I said, uh, yeah, whatever. And I hung up the phone. <laughs> and within two minutes, I get an email from Michael Dell. And you knew it was Michael Dell because the email address is very obvious of what it would be. So he emailed me from Dell and said, no, this really is Michael Dell and I want to speak to you about your company. I was like, oh shit, I just hung up on Michael Dell. <laughs> so we started having a conversation about what we created. And I just want to talk to you about what brand means to me. Brand is more than just a logo. Brand starts with the culture that you build on your team. Whether you're in a big company or whether you're starting as an entrepreneur, the culture that you build by selecting the people that come and join you as founders and as uh, you know, investors and just the people that are around you, the people that are employed by you, the culture is so super important because on the back of the culture, you're going to create a product. And this product is going to be a great product. And it's going to create a community. And the community becomes your evangelist. Your customers, essentially, the people that you take care of, become your evangelist. And that becomes the soul of your brand. That is where the brand foundation starts from, not from the logo, not from anything else. And when you do that, you can, you can create a movement. And so, you know, very few companies have figured that out. Very few companies have figured out how to build a community and nurture it and create a movement. Apple is one company that has done it. They've done an amazing job. You know, Starbucks has done it. There's many companies out there that have figured out how to nurture their brands and come together and, and, um, and, and create this, this brand evangelism or community. And Voodoo at the time was at the stage where we had a growing community. We, had, we were winning awards all over the place. Um, these are some of the magazines that we were featured in. <laughs> yeah, we didn't have a lot of female uh, customers at the time, and, you know, but it was, it was basically a very male-oriented product. And by the way, I'll talk to you about what happened after we joined HP, because when we joined HP, they wanted us to, to, to make it appealing to females, and I'll tell you how that conversation went. Um, it, was, it was an interesting conversation. But let me say that in 2005, we met with Michael Dell, we didn't align on a vision. It just didn't make sense for us to go together and, and work with him. We, we, we spent about a month and a half talking, and there was no alignment. The alignment was basically we wanted to build innovation, and we wanted to take our innovation and our design and help influence the, the Dell product line. They wanted to build their top line revenue, and that just wasn't our business. So in 2006, Hewlett Packard called, and this is back when Carly Fiorina was around, and. Uh, they started approaching us, and they wanted to talk to us more and get into deeper conversations. Anyways, 2006, HP acquired Voodoo. And it was a really interesting time, you know, for a short time. Um, I was at HP for three years physically. Mentally, I was probably there for a year. <laughs> it's funny when you're sitting in the back of the room, but trust me, when you're sitting at home, like, you know, wearing your pajamas and like not wanting to go into work and growing a beard. Like I had a beard, you know, and, and I'm in my 30s growing a, a beard sitting at home and just getting depressed, thinking about what we were doing in the company. We were doing some amazing things. Oops, let me back up. We were doing some amazing things. We were creating some award-winning systems. We created this system called HP Blackbird, um, which was a high-end desktop PC that scale. We created liquid cooling for their workstations and, and some really, really nice systems. And we, we had this great roadmap and we won every single award in the industry. But what ended up happening was they wanted us to scale our business. That was the, that was the, the, uh, the sort of discussion we had. We had a three-year plan. They wanted to bring it down to about three months. And basically, you know, the conversation with the product management people was like, well, you know, why don't we think about attracting more women to this product, right? And it's, it's, you can't just shoehorn, 
you know, as demographic into a product that has created a community and it's in a certain niche, it's really hard to do that. But one of the conversations we had, just to give you an idea of why I wanted to blow my brains out, was, uh, you know, hey, why don't we take that laptop and just paint it pink and make it smaller? Women will love that, right? You're all laughing. I mean, I know. It, I'm telling you, I'm in the conversation with people trying to, you know, rationalize this, but this is the kind of thinking that was going on because we had a bunch of men in the room trying to figure out how to target women. Right? And this is, you know, th this is where I go thinking about diversity and how to build diverse teams. But these are the type of conversations that we had. The long story short is Hewlett Packard basically, we came together and they wanted us to kind of scale this business as quickly as possible. And it was very, very, very hard to do. That is my first experience. And by the way, I don't blame anybody at HP for this. I blame myself for this. The reason I blame myself for this is as an entrepreneur, going inside a big company and thinking you know everything, you don't. You have no clue. And just like as somebody inside a big company trying to be an entrepreneur, it's hard. It's hard either way. But when you go into a big company, if you don't go in and start to infiltrate and start to work with people and start to collaborate, rather than coming in with a big arrogant attitude that you know everything, that's when things explode. So, you know, like I said, I was there for three years. I left the company to go do another startup that I co-founded called BrightSquid. And BrightSquid's still running, but what ended up happening was I got recruited by Microsoft. Long story is, uh, I, won't even, I won't even get into the recruitment process, but I will tell you this. Microsoft is, has been a long partner of mine. You know, I, I started Voodoo when I was very young. I'd always sell Windows, you know, with my PCs. I'd worked with Microsoft on a number of things. I was from Calgary, and I was sitting in my home in Calgary. Um, Hewlett Packard wanted me to move to, to Palo Alto, and I, I didn't want to move to the U.S. But when Microsoft called, I really had to think hard about this. You know, Microsoft, we have a living founder who's dedicated his life to make the world better. And I thought, you know, this is, this is actually a pretty amazing opportunity. I'm going to go try. I'm going to go see what it's like. And so I joined Microsoft two years ago. And in the first 11 months, I went through four different managers, four reorgs, right? And this happens a lot in big companies. Basically, I almost blew my brains out. I almost left the company. But let me just give you an idea of how this went. So I joined the company in January of 2011. And, uh, and we have this thing called calibration inside of big companies where, you know, you, you get calibrated against your peers. And, and it's, it's on a, a scale of one to five. I'm being super self-reflective here, and I just want to kind of tell you a little bit about it. Um, Five means you're really bad and you've you're, you're got to get another job. And, and one means you're awesome, oh my God, you get a super wicked bonus. So, so I started in the middle of calibration. So my first three months, the calibration ended and I got a three because I'd only been there for three months. But then the following year, I'd been there for 11 months and basically I hadn't really done a lot because I, wasn't, I hadn't figured out how to work inside the company yet. So on a scale of one to five, I was probably a nine. And I was probably going to be out of a job soon. But you know, I started to think about what can I do to help impact this company and to help make a difference inside this company. So I got together with a couple of people and we started something called the Bing Fund. And this was for entrepreneurs. I had to think about what can you do inside a big company like Microsoft where everybody around me is smarter than me? How can I help, how can I help the company and how can I make an impact to, to a space that I understand? I'm an angel investor, I've been investing for years, I've been an entrepreneur for years, what can I do to take that thinking into, inside of Microsoft? So I started the Bing Fund, and the Bing Fund is, is, uh, is basically an angel investment fund where we make investments in startups and then we help them grow. But the whole reason behind this is because we all know that startups are changing the world, right? The barriers for entry for startups have never been lower, and the accelerants have never been higher. And we know that small teams can innovate faster than large companies um, just, it's just the way it is. Because nowadays you can put five people in a room, you can develop something on the cloud, you can do something really interesting really fast and, and think quickly and act quickly. Where back when I first started Voodoo, we didn't have things like uh, incubators and accelerators, we didn't have access to funding, we didn't have friendly funding like the angel funding that we get nowadays. And every ecosystem is different and I can talk to you about that in a second. But the fact is access to mentors and funding are accelerating. And there's startup ecosystems all over the world beyond Silicon Valley. So when I think about what Microsoft can do as a platform, imagine if, if we were able to go and start helping other ecosystems and developing other ecosystems. So I've spent some time traveling the world thinking about all of this stuff. And when we think about with Microsoft, you know, what are the strengths that we have that we could offer the entrepreneur? Because I wanted to build a program as an entrepreneur that would help startups. 
So, you know, I, I, I wanted to say that, yeah, we're a strong partner, we could be a partner. You know, we have technology, so we have technology from Xbox to, you know, to, to our cloud. And then our cloud is completely open source friendly. But, but the big thing that we have is we have strong relationships in the enterprise. In other words, if you're an entrepreneur and you're building a startup, what is important to you? What is the number one thing that's important to you? And if I were to ask you to raise your hand and just tell me, anybody just tell me, anyone raise their hand and tell me what's the number one thing you focus on? Yes. Sorry? Team. Team? Okay. What else? Customers. customers. Exactly. We care about customers. We care about customer acquisition and we care about customer development. And if there's one thing that we can help with, what if we could connect you with customers? What if we could give you access to customers in a way that you, we couldn't have done before? In a way that we never did before. So in other words, if we partner with a startup and we start helping them build their business and we help them with business development and technology, that's all great. Accelerators do that all the time. But what if we start to connect them to customers and help them get access to scale in a much, a much larger way? So, you know, we have the BizSpark program, which many of you might know, but I just want to talk to you about what we did in 2012. The BizSpark program, basically, we, we give software and tools to startups. That's not enough. It's good, but it's not enough. When, because you can get software and tools from, from anywhere, really. But the software that we're, we're giving now, we're starting to think about how can, we, how can we make our cloud better? How can we add more value to our cloud? That kind of stuff we're thinking of. But in 2012, we kicked off accelerators around the world and our fund, the Bing Fund. We've had, now we've had actually 120 companies that have gone through. 85% were fully funded by Demo Day. We've had four acquisitions. There's multiple more acquisitions or multiple more companies in talks right now. Um, the amount of funding, the average funding depends on the region that they come from. So we've had investments, like in Israel, for example, the average funding is about a million dollars at uh, post-demo day. Uh, the average funding in India is about 85 lakhs, which is $150,000. Um, and, and what's interesting is we've noticed that a lot of the companies that we've worked with through our accelerators have hit their Series A and they're growing. 20% uh, tw of them now, but it's growing at a, at a, at a pretty good clip. These companies have come through our accelerators, and the nice thing is we don't take any equity. So the real question is, like, what's in it for us? We're not taking any equity, and then with our fund, we're putting in these very flexible convertible notes. So why is Microsoft even doing this? And, and I just have to say, there's, there's, you know, going back to what I talked about earlier with teams being disruptive and disrupting big companies, I had to think of a way that I wanted to create a, a, a small innovation team or an innovation team that could work with outside innovators outside entrepreneurs, help them build their businesses and build long-term partnerships with them. Because really, Microsoft should be doing that. We've helped you know, uh, create uh, platforms and all of this other stuff, but really, we should be helping the startup ecosystem build businesses. Because long-term, if, if we help you, you'll be long-term partners with us. And I think that enterprises of tomorrow are basically startups of today. You know, and I think that's, just, that's an obvious thing that all of us in this room understand. But inside of you know, big companies, they're just starting to sort of see this stuff. Microsoft has been helping startups for years. And, on, and you know, we've had all of these different groups. So I want to just quickly talk to you about the branding part. Because when you think about you know, what we have done, we had the BizSpark program. Then we had all these accelerators around the world. We have an accelerator in Tel Aviv. We have one in, in Seattle. We have one in, um, in, in Beijing. And we have one in Bangalore. And these accelerators were all run by different teams with different brands. And then we had the Bing Fund. And none of you knew about any of this. You might have known about the BizSpark program, but you didn't know about our accelerators. We had the Connect Accelerator, the Azure Accelerator, we had the Bing Fund, and all these different brands, which is a real problem. So when we really think about it, we wanted to take all of this, put it under one team, and then build the external fund, and come up with a very clear value proposition for startups, which is it's super simple. We're taking all of this under Microsoft Ventures, and our value proposition is, we want to help you create great businesses, but more importantly, we want to give you unparalleled routes to customers. And that, again, is the most important thing to startups, is getting access to customers. To us, to me, what's important is helping to develop other ecosystems. So I went to India recently. Um, I went to Bangalore to go visit you know, our startup accelerator there. And then I visited Mumbai to go see what's going on in the, in the startup ecosystem. Um, and I was kind of shocked, because when I went there, you know, I, the, the, the talent is very high. The talent is great. But they're all trying to just replicate what's happening in the US. In other words, you get off the plane in India and you immediately notice problems. You can see transportation issues. You can see all sorts of problems. There's infrastructure issues, political issues. There's so many local problems that can be solved. Yet, 
they're trying to solve, you know, how do I copy a company over here in the US or how do I be the next Instagram for blah or the next quirky for this? Like, they, they, they're not really thinking about long term how to solve problems. And so what's happening is these startups are basically coming up, they're trying to develop something really quickly without doing any customer validation whatsoever. They just want to engineer something soon and then exit quickly. So when we really dug into it, we realized why this is happening. It's happening because the investor ecosystem in India is a little bit uh, uh, unsophisticated at this point. In other words, the angel investors are coming in, they're taking way too much equity at the beginning, so uh, they're leaving the entrepreneur with very little equity in the end. So by the time they get to Series A, the entrepreneur is left with 20 to 30% in some cases, which is unheard of, it's unbelievable, because these entrepreneurs are going out, they're spending every living waking moment on their business, they're eating nothing, in order to build their business. They're starving, and then they're left with very little equity because the angels want to get quick, you know, want to get rich quick, basically. And so these people are left with little incentive other than to sell. Yesterday, I met an entrepreneur here, actually, at the Startup Fest, and he told me that he had raised um, $80,000 in his angel round. And I said, okay, so tell me about the note. And, um, and he said, what, note? And I said, well, how, how, how did you raise that $80,000? Well, friends and family. So what did you give up for that? 40%, 40% of his company he gave up for $80,000. Um, and I just, I just, you know, immediately you just say, well, look, I don't want to hear anymore because at the end of the day, we want you to be incented. We want you to build a great, um, a, a great product. I guess my point is that every ecosystem is different. And we're trying to go out now and we're trying to help develop these ecosystems. We're trying to bring in friendly entrepreneurs, friendly angels to help develop these ecosystems. And then we're creating this global accelerator platform, this global platform where all of our alumni from different regions can get together and talk. So, you know, we've had graduates from, from Beijing, we've had graduates from Bangalore, we've had graduates from Seattle, and we've also had uh, graduates from Tel Aviv. We have this, this alumni network of CEOs from around the world now talking to each other and figuring out, you know, hey man, I'm from Seattle, I want to get access to the China market, how do I make this happen? And they're helping each other and they're talking to each other and they're helping to build connections that way. And so this is the kind of thing that I wanted to do with Microsoft Ventures. So, you know, we have a number of partners around the world, but in, in Canada, we're, we're working with Mars, we're working with um, uh, Launch, Launch Academy in Vancouver, and, uh, and also um, uh, uh, Notman House as well. You guys all know Notman House. And uh, we have these current accelerators right now in Seattle, in Bangalore, in um, that's Tel Aviv, and this is Beijing, and this is Paris. We have an accelerator in Paris as well. And then we have these new accelerators coming up in, in, uh, in Rio. Actually, we have one in Sao Paulo in Brazil. We have a few different ones happening in Brazil because Brazil is just such a crazy market. Uh, we have one in Moscow as well. Um, this is Berlin. We just opened Berlin. I was just over there uh, last week. Uh, meeting with the team there. And so, you know, when we think about all of the things that we offer the entrepreneur and the, the programs that we wanted to create, we wanted to create a super entrepreneur-friendly program where we, we offer scales to market through our seed fund, we offer acceler you know, our accelerators where we don't take any equity, and then we, we partner with the community. We partner with third-party accelerators all the time, and, you know, this is essentially what Microsoft Ventures does. So, this is where you find us. You can sign up for BizSpark. You can look for BizSpark in your local community. You can visit us at MicrosoftVentures.com or you can follow us on Twitter. That's basically the Microsoft Ventures side of things. And this is, you know, I, I just, I kind of wanted to sort of tell you a little bit about, you know, the history, how I came up as an entrepreneur, and then how I ended up inside of Microsoft and building something for entrepreneurs. You know, it was, um, it's, it's been an interesting run for me. I mean, go, going as an entrepreneur from the outside into a big company on the inside, it was a struggle. Like I said, in my first 11 months, I almost left the company. But being able to create something like this to help entrepreneurs is something that's super meaningful to me. And I think you're going to see over the next few months as we grow and as we start to bring on uh, and make some more announcements that we're going to, uh, you know, make a pretty big impact in the way that Microsoft should and, and can. So any of you have any questions? Please raise your hand. Yes. Yeah. Hi, my name is Manender. Uh, do we have a microphone? No? Uh, uh, I'll, I'll okay. Speak okay. okay. I'm comfortable. Sorry. Yeah. My name is Manender. I'm a student in Toronto. And I basically belong from India. Uh, I, have a, I have my own startup, but uh, due to some government constraints, I am not able to incorporate company here in Canada. We've got some commitments for Angel Round in India. But uh, 
I said no, because I want to incorporate it in Canada. Right. Okay. Now, uh, here I met a lot many investors. Thanks. I met a lot many investors over here, and I've been meeting in Toronto. Now, they want the, that the company should be incorporated first, then only they can move ahead with the talks. That's right. Now, how does uh, Microsoft Ventures go about it? I mean, I'm not allowed. I'm on a student visa and work visa. Now, technically, a uh, government doesn't allow me to uh, incorporate, but due to my idea, everyone likes my idea, and uh, there's a stop blockage between like uh, how. So, do so stop there. What I would recommend you do is contact me, and I'll put you in touch with our CEO in residence in Bangalore, and okay. he can tell you how to make it happen. Oh, that's okay. That's that would yeah. Be. So um, you can just, my Twitter, just get a hold of me on yeah, Twitter and I'll DM you. Okay. Yeah? Thank you. Great. Any questions? Right here? Up here? This lady? This lady? Yes. <laughs> how are you? Catherine. Hi, Catherine. Uh, my question is, how are you... I'm learning a lot today. I didn't know Microsoft did so much. What are you guys going to do to get the message out there aside from doing events like this? I mean, you well, have great yeah. ideas, great resources, but nobody knows about them. Yeah, you know, um, it's a good question. So how we get the word out there is we just, we just prove ourselves. Right now, we're at the point where I just want to, I want to show value. You know, I, I want to be able to, to prove ourselves to the market. There was actually um, interesting, uh, we've made some interesting investments over the last couple of years. I don't know if any of you know this, but... Um, Waze actually came to us, uh, to our early stage startup accelerator in, in Tel Aviv. And we made a sizable investment in them in 2010. And uh, they, they were acquired by, by Google recently uh, for $1.1 billion. But you know, you probably never would have known that if, um, I mean, you probably don't know that, but, but going forward, if you think about it under sort of Microsoft Ventures and what we're trying to do, this is the kind of stuff that we need to do to tell a better story. Microsoft is a very complex company. You know, um, we, we're, we're just starting to come together as this, as this one devices and, and uh, services company. Uh, there was a big, you know, reorg, which I'm sure many of you heard of, uh, that was announced yesterday, um, where, where many of the teams are shifting to work as one team. It's, it's a phenomenal place to be right now. And, and just watching these changes from the inside, I can just say, I don't want to go out and start like, telling you, oh, this is great, you know, Microsoft's awesome, this is all the stuff we do. I mean, at the end of the day, it's all bullshit until we start delivering and showing you the, the, the impact that we're making. So what I can say is, you know, companies have come up through the BizSpark program. Yammer came up through the BizSpark program. They were acquired by Microsoft, right? Um, you know, there's a, there's a number of companies that, that get discovered that way, but now that we have this, this one team sort of looking at this portfolio, we're able to sort of handpick and select companies that we can make investments and help them grow. So I just need time. I want time to be able to prove it. Yeah. Yes? We actually only have one mic, so if you guys sure. have questions, come up to the front here. Don't be afraid. All right. Okay, so I think you sort of touched upon this a little bit, um, that Microsoft uh, Ventures does not take any equity. So the first question that sort of pops into my mind is, sorry, you wanted to say something? No, go ahead. Okay, so the first question that came into my mind is, obviously, what's the catch? Um, but I, I guess, uh, you know, where I'm going with this is this. Uh, in the past, there was a lot of um, negative association with Microsoft Extend and embr whatever, Embrace and Extend and all that stuff. You know, what sort of uh, guarantees or how do you assuage the fears of, of, of startups that maybe would work with Microsoft and, and maybe Microsoft would, would you know, it's, it's, take it's a, idea a, and pick it, up from there? It's a good question. So, so let me go back to the, the equity part. We don't take equity in our accelerators. We don't. Um, and we don't have a requirement that you work on Microsoft technology. So we're not asking you to develop apps for Windows in our accelerators. I'll be clear about that. We do take equity when we make investments, though. Um, but we do it via a convertible note. It's a very friendly convertible note. So it's not, it's not like we're asking for any rights of first refusals or anything weird like that. We're not. This is meant to be a very entrepreneur-friendly program to say, look, you know, we're here. Here is, our, here is our offerings. Come work with us and, and just see what a good partner we can be. I, I know what you're saying about perception, um, but I can say that I think the perception of Microsoft is, 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 is changing. I think, I, think it's, I think we, you know, in the startup space, we definitely have a lot of work to do. But I think generally speaking, I think uh, if you come in on the inside and you look at the culture that, that was created from the founder, which is really a very giving culture, I think it, it, it permeates inside the company. I, I think we need to tell that story better externally. Um, but, you know, all, all we can do is say, try us, right? Sign up for BizSpark. It doesn't cost you anything. You, you, you know, you sign up. 
Um, you, you start to get discovered, we look at you, and then you can decide if you want to apply to one of our accelerators. Talk to any of our alumni, and they'll tell you stories about how, how we've been able to help them. Um, and, and the question about what is, you know, what's in it for us, I think I kind of already said that. I said, you know, we're, we're working with entrepreneurs who aren't coming to us for jobs, but they're doing disruptive things on the outside. We then have access to say, you know, this might be an interesting company. Maybe we should make an offer to acquire them. Doesn't mean you have to sell to us, but you know, you never know. There might be a time and uh, a point in time where you want to sell to us. Either that, or you become a long-term partner of Microsoft's. But this is about helping develop an ecosystem, ecosystems around the world. So just a short follow-up. So for Canadian um, startups, yes, I noticed. Um, yes, you didn't, you didn't, see, you didn't see Canada up exactly. there, right? Exactly. So. so so right now we have Seattle uh, for our own first-party accelerators. However. We're partnering with uh, two or three. Well, we're partnering with the three that I mentioned um, in in Canada, and we are we're we're developing a program where we can take companies that are coming out of their accelerators and and give them preference into coming into our accelerator. Which means, again, you're going through a Canadian accelerator. You might be giving up equity here, but you won't be giving up equity when you come to us to go to the next level. And we can take companies at any stage. Do we have to relocate to Seattle or what you, have you? you? You should relocate to Seattle for a period of time in order to go through the, you know, the proper acceleration Thank you very much. process. Yep. Thank you. Any other questions? Oh, great. Yes. Uh, does your program support services companies uh, that not necessarily uh, Developing a product or uh, software. You mean like a landscaping company? No, no, not, not, nothing like that. Uh, okay. Like, for example, a project management company in the IT space that uh, uses technology to to deliver its services. I, I mean, po possibly, um, if it's a if it's a, a services company where we can build a platform and it's a scalable right. platform, then possibly we would look at it. Okay. But but we're not, you know, for example, we're not going to go uh, uh, work with a consulting company. Uh, inside of Microsoft Ventures and, and have them go talk to all of our, you know, customers to consult for them, right? right. Th this is about building, you know, disruptive technologies, okay. scalable technologies that, that can make an impact. Okay, so, yeah. thank you. Any others? That's it, we got a yellow light, so last question. Nothing? Great. Okay, well, thank you very much.